right. Well, it's always good to be back. Uh, it's a, well, we'll pray and then I'll read and talk a little bit. Lord, we come to you this morning on the first Sunday in Advent, a great day for an ordination. We thank you for Josh's ordination and thank you that we can all be here worshiping you this morning. We pray that you would open our hearts to your word and help us, especially during the season of Advent, to feel your presence with us and to share it with each other. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, our reading is uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to read from verse 4 to 31. Paul writes, I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Jesus Christ. For in him you have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking and in all your knowledge, because of our testimony about Christ and its confirmation in you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong until the end, so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, is faithful. So I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another, so that there, be, there may be no divisions among you, and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers, some from Chloe's household, have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One follows Apollos. Another says, I follow Cephas. Another says, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized into the name of Paul? I'm thankful that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius. So no one can say that you were baptized in my name. Yes, I also baptized the house of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the intelligence of the intelligent will I frustrate. So where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since the wisdom of God, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believed. The Jews demand miraculous signs, and the Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to a, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God for the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God stronger than man's strength. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things of this world and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us the wisdom of God and that our righteousness holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Now, I love that we're doing uh, the Advent readings here. I saw the wreath and liked it because it ties in very 
much with what I want to talk about this morning, about hope and how much of a gift that is to us. Now, it's uh, not very often that I get to speak. Chaplain's job is mostly listening. So I get to hear a lot of stories, and some of them are really exciting. Some of them are very sad. And most of them are searching for hope. Just something little, like a rock climber seeking purchase, just a little hand ledge maybe to hang out for a couple more hours or a couple more minutes. That's one reason why I love the season of Advent. It kind of gives us that ledge. It gives us that hope when we come to this time of year. Because it is a beautiful, wonderful time of year. Not the weather necessarily, or the fact that it's dark before the sun's up again. Uh, it seems like it anyway. Um, but more about people enjoying things. We put up lights for no reason. You know, why? we were driving uh, down in Chinatown the other day and, and down around downtown Chicago and there were lights on everything and there were trees up and um, it was just amazing. Everything was glittering and sparkling. Even if you go through Moni, they have decorations up. Through the one main street. The girls were pointing them out on the way over this morning. And so, you know, things really change around this time of year. Uh, Advent marks the beginning of the Christian New Year. If you follow the liturgy, the liturgical calendar, the Christian calendar, this is our New Year. We end with Thanksgiving in America and begin with the first week of Advent. We give thanks for the past year and we hope for a good year to come. Most of all, what I like about Advent is how much it reminds us to follow Christ, how much it is about Jesus if you look for it and you desire to find it. Because you can drown Jesus out during Advent, and we've done that to a large extent in this country. You know, there are commercials and toys, and it can make you feel like the Grinch with all the noise, 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 and you just want to run away screaming, especially when they start Christmas carols right after Halloween, or even before, like mid-October. Um, it's a very hopeful time of year. It's a wonderful beginning, and it reminds us to follow more in Christ's footsteps. It's a time when he came and fulfilled the promise to Abraham, as we read from the Old Testament readings. All of the prophets and all of the patriarchs and all of the men and women were waiting on the promise of Abraham, which was Jesus Christ. One time I got to kind of talk about Advent in the hospital. We had a patient who, uh, not a patient, patients usually don't talk, but it was one of their parents, and we were walking down a hallway, just happened to meet, and he said, we had a strange minister come into our church. He told us that the promise to Abraham was really Jesus Christ, and not that they would be this huge uh, family, this large nation named after him, but that the promise was really Jesus, and that's how all the world would be blessed through him. And it was really neat to see that he was mulling that over from the passage on Sunday. And that was the first time he had ever thought of that. And it kind of blew his mind, and he was still wrestling with that. It reminded me of what it's like to get a tremendous gift or to see something new. And I think that coming to Advent is a time to come back to our faith and see it as something new, see it as something wonderful, something worth sharing, something worth talking to, talking about with one another as we go through our day. 
Now, the Advent reading that I read is the first one. It's the gospel reading for this first week in Advent. But the Advent reading only goes up to verse 9. I read the rest to give us some context into what Paul was writing about. The Advent reading is, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always give thanksgiving thanks to God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him we have been enriched in every way. In all your speaking and in all your knowledge, because of our testimony about Christ, because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you, therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, is faithful. And that really is the hope that we have here in Advent. But to understand why he said that, we have to hear the rest of the passage. You know, he starts off, Paul starts off with a very positive, hopeful message. But but to give them the full sense of hope that they're receiving, he talks about some of the issues in Corinth. He talks to them about their infighting. Who are we following? Their need to be right. They want to win. Who's got the message? Who are you going to follow? Are you following Paul or Apollos, who is a dynamic speaker and evangelist of the day? Or Cephas, who is Peter, who actually walked with Jesus? Who are you going to follow? Who are you following? Are you following the right one? Then he gets to the next issue. Some of you are looking to organize faith into your Corinthian culture, make it a part of that wisdom culture of the Greeks. And he says, no, the, it, it's foolishness. If you're trying to look at it strictly logically, it's foolishness. God chose a mysterious way to save us. And what he means by that is he's not picking out the best people. You know, when you uh, play a game of pickup basketball and you select captains and the whole idea is to, you know, you pick a good person and then they pick a good person and you kind of go down. It, the whole idea is, you know, a logical way to approach making a team is to pick the best. That's what you want to do. But God didn't take a logical approach when creating the church. As a matter of fact, he came to save sinners, which is a real head-scratcher for some of them. And then for the Jews, they were looking for a sign. They were looking for signs and wonders. They had just been through all of the Old Testament. They had followed pillars of fire. They had seen the walls of water in the Red Sea. They had seen the ocean stand on end. They were looking for a sign, not a baby. And so here God sends a baby into the family of a very poor couple. He's born in a barn. And this is what we're supposed to nail our hope on. The baby eventually does grow up, and we do eventually nail our hope upon him. Paul says one other thing to them he, in verse 26. He says, Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were even influential. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of the world, the despised things of the world, the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him 
you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us the wisdom of God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. It's always a humbling experience when we resonate with the experience of the Corinthians, or what Paul admonishes them with rings true for us. Because it seems like they had a lot of problems. They had two books of corrective prescription given to them. I mean, well, I suppose we have a little bit more in the 66 we get. But the Corinthians struggled with some issues. And I, I must confess, I struggle with many of the same issues that the Corinthians did. struggle with wanting to be right. That's one thing that, that we all, we all want to win. We all want to be right. And so in this time of Advent, we're invited to consider maybe just journeying along and not winning. Now, we, we like to, and I can't tell you how many years, uh, how many places I see it year-round, the Vince Lombardi quote, winning's not everything, it's the only thing. And, and we treat it like it's the only thing. We want to win at life, but winning will make you crazy. Winning is not conducive to building relationships unless you're collecting all the best people into a team for yourself. Advent and Christmas isn't about winning. Sometimes we want our Christianity to justify our culture. Just like the Jews and the Greeks did. They were looking for something specific. They wanted Christianity or God's saving grace to come to them in a way that they felt would best suit them. Perhaps through a completely logical set of proofs for the Greeks, or a grand sign for the Jews. But he came in humility, which confounded both. And Paul reminds us why, by asking the Corinthians to consider who they were in their lives past, and consider who we are 2,000 years later. He says, not, brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise, not many strong, not many influential. And we can say, praise the Lord, we weren't. Because we were called into a family. Called into being, called into a great relationship of love. And that's what our hope is in. It's not the best who are going to spend eternity in a loving relationship with God. It's not the fastest who will arrive and get all the goodies before everybody else gets there. It's not the strongest who, by their sheer force, will pound down the gates of heaven. But God has opened the door for all of us, his children. In John chapter 1, we hear a lot about Jesus Christ at the beginning of the world, and John talks about Jesus being the creative force behind creation. He's the power there. He says, John says, without him, we would not be here. In him, we live and breathe and have our being. I like to think of that cosmic conversation that happened during creation way back in Genesis when God asks God's self, let us create man in our own image. I like to think that that was Jesus speaking up there as part of the Trinity, saying, let us make beings who are relational, who can talk to each other, who can love each other, and can share this creation with us forever. 
See, Advent is a time when we can go back and remember the very basics. Question number one. What is the chief end of man? To glorify God and enjoy Him forever. It's an invitation on a very long journey. A journey not of minutes or of a month or of a few weeks, but of a lifetime. And then eternity. A lifetime that never ends. I uh, was able to talk with the family a uh, couple weeks ago now. They experienced a Christmas moment. It was a Catholic family. They were speaking Spanish, and they had a, uh, a boy had a disorder. He was 13 years old, and he needed a bone marrow transplant. And somebody in England donated bone marrow, and his bone marrow was flown across the ocean, and they asked for a blessing of the cells. It's probably one of the happiest facets of what I get to do. And we don't know when the cells get there, so it's about 3 in the morning, and I'm there, and we have an Italian priest who was a missionary to Peru there. And so we're there in the room, and everybody's speaking Spanish, and, and um, we each got the opportunity to bless every single person in the room, bless the cells, bless the donor. And it was just like Christmas in there. People were cheering and crying, and, and it, everything was festively decorated. And as we walked out of the room, mom came out. She came back out and thanked them, and she shared some of her concerns. She said, what if he doesn't make it? What if he dies? What hope is there then? She, she couldn't say that in the room, and dad didn't want to have this conversation. But mom came out, and she talked to us and asked us, what happens if it doesn't work? What is there to hope for when this our last avenue of treatment is exhausted. And the priest said something very wise. He said, God gives us life, and it is beautiful, whether it's for one day or a hundred years on earth, because we get to spend the rest of it with him in eternity. Advent is a time where we're invited to slow down and consider our life. Because it's not about the end. You know, it's not about achieving, it's not about lighting all these candles, getting to the white one. It's not a race. It's about waiting. And waiting, and waiting. If you were a kid, and you got to December, you knew Christmas was only 25 days away but you had to wait each of those days for presents. If your house was decorated and, or you had out-of-town guests come in, as we frequently did, you know, they couldn't be there for Christmas, but maybe early at the beginning, their presents, they would bring them, and they would go under the tree, and we wouldn't open them. And we had to look at them every day, and we had to wait. One of the things that I look forward to during Advent is doing the Advent candles and lighting one every night. Actually, this is a real treat. Being in the hospital, we're not allowed to use real fire because the whole thing will blow up and <laughs> all because of all the gases and medicine. But um, hospitals are highly flammable. We run fire drills twice a day. It's, it's ridiculous. But uh, being able to see a flame and we light them one at a time at home and and uh, just really a reminder to me that sometimes you have to slow down. Sometimes you have to wait. Sometimes it's not even about what's wrapped under the tree, shockingly. But it's about waiting those four weeks and getting there because so much good stuff happens this week. This week... We were reminded of waiting. We had a schedule planned where we had every day filled to capacity.
to come up to Chicago. We were going to see both museums, see the lights downtown, and then everybody got sick. But it was nice because we got to spend the time just kind of hanging out. And sure, you know, you had the nausea and, and the headaches and, and everything that goes with it, and that wasn't wonderful. But spending time together and playing board games is wonderful. Sharing life is wonderful and how beautiful that can be. Just being excited to be together and just be there. That's what Advent calls us into. That's what Paul was trying to tell the Corinthians here. It's not a race. It's not a meritocracy. The person who doesn't, the person who does the best does not get all the beans. Uh, or maybe the person who does the best just gets all the beans and they miss out on all the rest of life. Life is a wonderful thing. It is a precious commodity. It's something that you have to nurse and care for and cherish and enjoy. The invitation that we have that the theologians of old spent countless councils on in hundreds of years to get the question and answer to the Westminster Catechism, that question and answer number one, what is the chief end of man? Enjoying God forever. That can all start today. It should start today. That's why God has called us to himself, so that we can enjoy him forever. And in doing that, we will bring him glory. We will love one another. Because I'll tell you what, when people are happy, that spreads. Just like when people are upset, that spreads. We can have uh, some scary situations, and those are usually when there's a sudden death or an accident, and there's so much loss and grief and sadness, and many times anger. We can have a room full of 30 people celebrating life or a room full of 30 people about to riot and burn down the hospital. And we have both about equally. And I think the main difference is if you're prepared, if you're walking with God, if you're on a journey, a long road, some of the folks who are sick in the hospital for a long time get to that place and they realize they're on a very long road and they have resolved to seek out God and enjoy Him. So why can't we have Christmas the whole year around? I think that would be a great challenge on this first day of the Christian New Year. What about sharing God's love year round? Maybe you don't have to witness to somebody. Maybe it's just being kind to start with. Because that changes everything. In the end, further down, Paul writes, they'll know you are Christians, not by your strength, not by your power, not by your merit, not by your social standing, not by how much God has blessed you, but they will in fact know you are Christians by your love. How much you love each other and how much you love the people that God places in your path on a daily basis. The people that God has thought fit to bless with his image and your presence. Let us pray. Lord, we ask for your blessing upon us. We ask that you would continue to lead us. Lord, and we ask for your blessing not just for our attainment, but so that we can take it 
and bless others. I'm reminded of, reminded of the good, the bad, and the indifferent servants, Lord, who took that gift from their master, and one went out and multiplied it, and another went out and did a fair job, and the third just buried it, Lord. Help us not to bury our faith, which is what you have blessed us with, but to go out and to use it and multiply it and return the joy you have placed in our heart a hundredfold. Help us not just to eat joy, but to share joy and to spread it around. Not only at this wonderful time of Advent where we remember your birth and we look forward to your saving sacrifice for us. Where we look at two very different trees, but one loving Savior. We ask that we would hold both in our hearts and share both freely. We pray for your blessing upon those who cannot be at church today, who are sick, who are in pain of any kind, spiritual, emotional, physical. Pray that they would feel your presence both now and forever because we know you promise to be always with us. Help us to feel your presence during this Advent season. Help us to wait. Help us not to look to the things of the world, to achievement, to winning, to wisdom, or, or tremendous signs and spectacles. But help us to join you in walking on that road to Emmaus. Even when we don't recognize you at first, have patience with us, Lord. Thank you for the invitation to join you. And God bless us all. Amen.